but next, we're going to be diving into the world of NFTs. So I don't know if you remember this, but like CNN for a while was doing uh, like NFTs of their big stories or whatever, which I remember looking at and thinking like, what? What are they doing? Like at, at TechCrunch, that's not what I want to do at all. At TechCrunch, we're over here like, delete, 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 delete. Like, oh, who said what? We said something? No, no, no. I don't think, I don't remember that. So there's no provenance whatsoever. I don't want an indelible record of a thing, right? But uh, our expert on NFTs is OpenSea CEO, Devin Finzer, who's going to come to this stage here with moderator Anita Ramaswamy. So please welcome them up. So, Devin, NFTs, very, uh, you know, tends to elicit strong reactions from folks. And I want to start our conversation today by asking you, what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions people have about NFTs? Sure, yeah, and thanks so much for, for having me. Um, I think one of the big misconceptions about NFTs today is that they're primarily just collectibles or profile pictures. Um, yeah. And actually, the world of NFTs is quite diverse. Um, Things that we're excited about at OpenSea include NFT. I think there have been a couple presentations today about NFTs inside of games, um, and that's really just uh, sort of just the beginning. Um, we've, we're seeing a ton of explosion of innovation in the gaming space. Um, if you think about a game as this often very sophisticated economy that's centrally controlled by the game developer, well, what if you could really use digital ownership to make that an open economy from the beginning? Um, so games, um, use cases in event ticketing uh, for NFTs, uh, physical objects as NFTs, um, and then really just sort of the diversity of use cases, I think, is, is something, sometimes a little underrepresented in um, the mainstream kind of dialogue around NFTs. Yeah, it's kind of wild to me that there are so many types of NFTs out there. Um, and I'm curious of, of the types that you mentioned. Are there any in particular that you're actually investing resources in from OpenSea? Yeah, so we're investing a lot of resourcing in um, a couple areas. The first is just better discovery on the marketplace. So today you come to OpenSea and you know, there's, there's opportunity to browse and, and look around and figure out what are the most popular projects. Um, but we really want to invest in better uh, exploration of those different categories. So allowing people to dive deep into gaming, um, to dive deep into ticketing, um, and really just uh, browse and, and have OpenSea be this, this destination for, for NFTs, which I think it is today. But there's really much more we can do to, to uncover the, the world of NFTs. Um, and then the second area that we're investing a lot in is our primary drops product, which is essentially a way for um, games and projects to not only have their secondary marketplace on OpenSea, sort of the, the eBay style experience, but also uh, launch their project directly on OpenSea. Um, and so we've now done five or six uh, different primary drops with a bunch of different partners, some of which are uh, in the gaming space as well. Gotcha. Yeah. And you know, I think to take a step back and just look at the market backdrop, you know, all of crypto is in a bit of trouble right now. NFT trading volumes have been falling pretty steadily um, since the crypto downturn began. And I'm wondering, what do you think are the use cases for NFTs that will help regain enthusiasm or you know, spark some excitement about this again? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, would, I would really point to gaming as one of those use cases. Um, but I think one of the exciting things is that you know, NFTs are sort of this basic building block, right? And um, now, over the last four years, through the ups and downs of the market, there have been a number of projects that have just kind of continued building those foundational kind of pieces of infrastructure that are needed to take this to the next level. So examples of those include um, the wallets, right? The wallets are getting a lot better. They're getting easier to use. Um, marketplaces like ours are getting uh, more robust, more accessible. Uh, On-ramps into crypto are getting a lot better. And so now, now that those sort of foundational tools have been built, um, it's really a great time for developers and projects to start exploring the wide design space of NFTs now that you know, people are a little more uh, accustomed and the, the flow for you know, basic things like purchasing uh, are, are a lot simpler for people. How does the recent news and recent negative market sentiment affect your business? I mean, especially with trading volumes declining. Yeah, so it's it's definitely been um, a big shock to the entire industry, and you know my heart goes out to those who have been directly impacted by this. Um, it's it's certainly like a, a big moment for crypto, and uh, and certainly a setback. 
Um, that being said, I would say NFTs are a different part of crypto than, than the rest of the uh, ecosystem. They're certainly intertwined, but one of the exciting things about um, our market is that we really are trying to reach uh, a broader audience, right? We're not just interested in um, this, this specific financial use case for crypto. We're more interested in how does this affect the creator economy? How does this affect big brands? How does this affect gaming? Um, and so we're less impacted, I would say, than, um, than the rest of the ecosystem. Um, and then I, I think the other thing to note is it really is just a time for us to invest in uh, building trust with users, right? And the magical thing about OpenSea is we're actually built on um, decentralized technology natively. So if you go and you purchase something on OpenSea, it's through a smart contract as opposed to through a central custodian. Um, and so that is a much stronger decentralized foundation um, than what we've seen with some of the kind of recent collapses uh, for, for the more centralized portion of crypto, which you know, is certainly necessary. But um, what's exciting now is that you can use these uh, products like OpenSea where um, you're really interacting in a decentralized way, which gives us the ability, uh, as long as we really invest in that technology, to build a strong trust with users. And I know you mentioned that you feel that OpenSea is less affected, but in a way, couldn't you also be more affected given that you're sort of going for this market of you know, users who might not be as crypto native who now might have lost a lot of trust in the industry? Perhaps, I, I think, um, but the, the interesting thing to note, right, is that a lot of people who are starting to engage with NFTs don't necessarily directly associate it with crypto. So I think one really interesting data point here is uh, Reddit launched uh, an NFT project, right. but it was actually marketed as digital collectibles, and they onboarded a couple million users uh, to crypto wallets without those users actually knowing um, that there was, there was crypto behind the scenes. Um, so I think similar for us, right? We want to uh, really make this something where it's about the creator economy, it's about these brand new consumer, so even social uh, use cases, as opposed to just branding it as crypto. Um, and what's interesting about the Reddit and, and, and now Instagram experiences is um, that's really resonating with creators and, and it's sort of being this um, on-ramp into the crypto ecosystem that isn't necessarily as scary or as jargony as um, you know, sign up for, a, uh, for an account with, this, with XYZ yeah. Exchange, right? I guess speaking of Instagram and Reddit and all of these bigger players, I mean, Meta is a huge company. They're, they have money. They have resources to invest in this. Are you afraid at all that Instagram getting into NFTs will threaten your business? No, actually, we're, we're really excited about that. So um, I think one of the things that's always excited me about uh, Web3 is that it's uh, a layer that's complementary and symbiotic with Web2. And I think a great example of this was the Twitter integration. Um, I think it was uh, last year where Twitter integrated NFTs directly into their uh, products where you could basically right, yeah. set an NFT as your profile picture and it would link out into OpenSea. Um, and it's a great example of NFTs being integrated into the fabric of Web2, um, but having their own complementary experiences like marketplaces that are much more native to Web3. Um, and so we see projects like Instagram um, and Reddit uh, and Twitter really as making this just more solid and more integrated as opposed to being uh, you know, directly competitive. Would you say I, I want to, you know, sort of rephrase yeah. what you're saying and see if I understood it. You're, are you sort of saying that these platforms can act maybe as an on-ramp to bring users? 100%, yeah, yeah. Got it. And I guess what gives you faith that users will care enough to want to trade on a decentralized exchange when the ease of use um, with the product like, like Facebook or with Instagram has been just, it's been so sticky, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, look at what we saw with Reddit, for example, was there were, you know, there was a lot of onboarding through Reddit, but then people came to OpenSea when, as they understood that this was a user-owned uh, digital item, right, and that it could be bought and sold on a decentralized marketplace. We actually saw a lot of um, activity from, from the Reddit use case. So I'm, I don't think, um, you know, we're trying to kind of uh, attack every single angle of the market. I think um, Instagram is, a, is really useful as an onboarding experience, but there are these people who are going to want to take those items and actually use a more Web3 native type tool that allows the full diversity of use cases, right? Um, the full analytics suite that we provide on OpenSea, uh, all of the sophisticated ways that we allow people to buy and sell, um, the discovery component of finding other things that they're interested in. Uh, so we think that 
you know, over time, that becomes more and more valuable. The trust and safety work that we've done to allow people to both discover, but also safely purchase, um, all of those kind of contribute to uh, a really strong product that we've built. OpenSea, I think, is in a really interesting moment in time right now because you have been you know, sort of the market leader for a while, but you also have more competitors than ever at this point, and a lot of your competitors are moving to cut fees. So what do you think a zero-fee NFT world will look like? Well, I don't necessarily think that we're moving to a zero-fee NFT world. Um, and in fact, I think the exciting thing that we always um, think about when we see more competition entering the space is just that there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of room for innovation. And I do think that uh, it's important to remember that the NFT space is incredibly early. We're still in day zero for the space and we still have so much room to kind of grow the whole pie. Um, so we don't see these new entrants as necessarily hyper problematic, more as just tools for engaging with different audiences, right? So some of the most recent marketplaces really engaging with um, that power user. Uh, some of them really are targeting specific verticals, going after art. And we think of that as really just making the space more, more vibrant um, and, and, um, and really spreading awareness around this, this new industry. What user base would you say you're targeting that's different from, say, like Magic Eden or, you know, any of these Joe Pegs, like all, all, all these upstarts that have come out? Yeah, I would say um, the, we, we have a, a wide uh, diversity of um, uh, users on OpenSea. So I would say that OpenSea today does have a really strong brand with, the, with people who are really curious about NFTs, right? I think for a lot of people who are new to this space, OpenSea is that one destination where they go and they learn. Um, we've just published a number of um, articles on how to get started. Uh, we, ha we have a whole learn center dedicated to sort of that, um, that new user who's, who's more of just a curious person. Um, but then we also provide a, a really good set of tools for someone who's graduating into more of someone who wants to spend, you know, maybe a, a couple days per week or even, you know, a lot of our users are spending many hours per day on OpenSea, browsing around, using the product, understanding uh, what's going on with different collections. Um, and we've invested a lot of tools for those folks. So uh, one uh, feature that we launched recently was analytics on our collection page where you can really dive deep and understand uh, trend lines and, and um, you know, spend a lot of time there. And, and users were just overblown um, excited about that, that feature. So we really do see OpenSea serving um, not just the sort of curious user, um, but also someone who's graduated to more of a power user experience. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like you guys are serving a pretty broad and diverse set of customers. And I am curious, though, still, like, when it comes to the competition, if, if they're serving segments of your customer base, are you not worried that they're going to undercut you on price? Not as worried just because I think, uh, again, it's just so early, right? And so um, we think that being able to have, uh, one of the beautiful things about Web3 is you have uh, many different options, right? You don't have to use OpenSea if you don't want to, which is, which is actually, I think, maybe, maybe one of the more underrated or, or um, underappreciated components of the space, right? You really can take your wallet from OpenSea and, and into another experience, but that's also the magic of it, right? That also means that we're just uh, leveling up the, the product experience. And for us, we've, we've always been um, deeply invested in building a team that's able to continually innovate on product, continually make the product better. Um, and we've spent the last four years really investing in that muscle. Um, and so we welcome competition. We welcome um, folks that are pushing the space forward. Um, and we, we use that as fuel to make our own product better. What will it take for OpenSea to maintain its position as a market leader? I think it really comes down to just strong product execution um, and continuing to build trust with users. So um, I think the area that I would really highlight for us has been our trust and safety team. And that's a team that's not just looking at how do we improve the experience on OpenSea specifically, but also how do we improve the whole ecosystem. So a lot of the stuff that we do is we'll work with wallets to ensure that wallets are able to provide users with the requisite warnings. If a website looks problematic and is a phishing website, uh, we'll scan URLs from different collections and ensure that we uh, remove that content from OpenSea. 
Um, and then we'll do things like detecting problematic transfers or problematic stolen items and try to just deal with those sorts of scenarios as best we can for users. So I think one of our strengths is we've really from day one been extremely invested in building a trusted brand and a trusted product. Um, and not every you know, NFT platform or marketplace can really say that. So you mentioned that investing in your team is sort of a big aspect of, of what you do and what's important to OpenSea's advantage. At the same time, it's a tough market. And you, like many other crypto companies, have you know, gone through some like, shifts and layoffs. And like, how, do, how do those two things square up, I guess, if you know, you're kind of letting people go, but then also trying to invest in your team? How do you reconcile that? Yeah, well, I think um, we, we have to adapt to market conditions, right? I don't think anyone, um, any company really in the crypto space foresaw the combination of a macroeconomic downturn plus a crypto winter simultaneously, right? That's a pretty rare... I didn't see it, so... <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a pretty rare thing to, to witness. Um, and so, you know, it, it was um, extremely regrettable and unfortunate that we had to make some adjustments to our team size, um, but it was necessary to ensure that uh, we're operating effectively um, in a brand new market paradigm, right? And so I don't think those things are necessarily uh, in conflict, right? You can still build a really strong team. Um, you just have to ensure that you're set up from a um, revenue and cash flow perspective to be able to navigate, um, you know, a different ecosystem, a different environment, right? Sure. I, I do want to talk about some other recent news um, that OpenSea has been involved in. So you recently released this suite of creator tools, which you were pretty excited to talk about. Um, at the same time, though, I'm curious, why would creators want to use your creator tools when you've considered getting rid of creator royalties on the platform? Like, how can they trust you, essentially? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that I, I would say that I wouldn't characterize us as like considering getting rid of all creator fees. Um, in fact, just to be super clear about kind of what we announced to the community. The first thing we announced to the community was a suite of tools um, that would allow creators to um, uh, enforce creator royalties on chain, right? And so there was this existing problem in the space where a lot of marketplaces, not us, in fact, um, were building tools, or, uh, building systems that did not respect creator royalties. So we took a look at the space and we said, how can we lead with a solution that will allow creators to actually enforce their royalties? Because the status quo was that um, uh, royalties were sort of trending to zero. So we released that tool and we also said, you know, there's a, a challenge with existing collections that can't necessarily upgrade their smart contract to... And, Sorry, I'm getting a little into the technical no, weeds, but they can't necessarily upgrade their smart contract um, to use this tool. And we want to have an open dialogue with the community about um, what we should do for those sorts of collections. Um, we talked to the community, and then we decided to move, uh, move forward with a creator-first solution and allow all of those collections, despite not implementing that tool, to also receive creator fees. So I think the move but, that But you were considering getting rid of creator royalties on the platform, right? Like similar to what some of your competitors have done? We were, we were figuring out for that specific subset of collections because they had already trended to zero, right? What should we do, right? And it was, a con it was an open conversation with creators around, um, you know, should we, should we still enforce creator fees on old collections if they are not able to upgrade? Um, and what we decided to do was that we said we would continue enforcing despite these collections not being able to upgrade. I guess to me, I wonder, like, why was that even a question or consideration? Cause, great question, yeah. You know, I feel like royalties are so, so central yeah, 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 to the yeah. value prop of NFTs. It's a great question. So I think the reality is if you look at those existing collections, yes, they had creator fees on OpenSea, but the trend line, because everyone was moving to other marketplaces, was that they weren't receiving creator fees. Right, because if you imagine um, a world where you know 80% of a particular collection is traded on a marketplace that doesn't enforce fees, well, then the creator is not actually benefiting, right? And so we actually really did have to work with creators to figure out what was the right solution for for this, and and we also felt it was really important to ensure that folks knew that this was a problem, right? Because a lot of people were operating under the assumption that their creator fees were were still being respected, and that just wasn't the case. So you considered getting rid of them because your competitors were doing so, essentially? Not because our competitors were doing so, but rather because the, the system was not working for, those, for both new collections and those existing collections. Got it. Um, sort of moving to another area that I want to ask about, 
OpenSea doesn't have a native token. Do you have any plans to launch one? Nothing to announce. Nothing to announce at the moment. No. Okay. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, another another piece of sort of recent news I wanted to discuss was this lawsuit against one of your former employees for insider trading, and you know something I've been thinking about a lot is like how do you draw the line internally as to what actually constitutes in the NFT space insider trading versus what doesn't? I mean, the issue at hand was sort of you know the employee having knowledge of what was going to be listed on the website, how is that any different from, you know, other cases? Like, it seems like a gray area. How do you draw the line? Yeah, well, first of all, I would say that this was an isolated incident um, over a year ago. So it was a long time ago, and sure. there have been no such incidents for, for OpenSea since. Um, and, you know, we handled that by uh, letting go of that particular employee. Um, and we've always, from day one, had strict confidential information use case uh, policies. Um, and we think it's really important to have a level playing field for the people that use OpenSea. So we have a set of policies. You know, I, I think to your point, um, it's it's a it's the type of thing where the devil's in the details, and you just need to ensure that you're really putting users first and you're building user trust. Um, but we have a set of internal policies that uh, really, you know, are, are zero tolerance with regards to employees using confidential information for their own benefit. Got it. Well, so we've talked a lot about the market, and I guess given this current market situation, how are you adapting from a runway standpoint, and how are you managing your runway as a company? Yeah, so I mean, if you've looked at if you look at the uh, sort of volumes uh, for NFTs uh, over the last little while, there was a significant downturn um, when the when the market crashed, um, but levels have stabilized, right? And we. We did take action to ensure that we were set up to navigate this type of environment, um, and so you know we're we're actually in a really good position financially. Um, uh, we're we're seeing growth in sort of new product areas as well. So uh, we'll continue investing in in this market and continue really putting putting user product experiences first. Um, and so that's you know we of course uh, adapt to changing market conditions as as the ecosystem evolves, but that's sort of how we're thinking about it at high level. When do you think will be the next time you'll need more capital? Uh, it's, it's, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so don't, don't want to share that answer with me. That's, that's fine. Um, no, no hints on that? No, sorry. Okay. sorry. All right. Um, okay, I got, I got a couple of fun questions that I want to end this on. Sure. I want to ask, um, why did you name your company OpenSea? Yeah, well, so there were... There were kind of a variety of reasons uh, we were thinking about the name OpenSea. Uh, to be honest, one of the main reasons was the OpenSea.io was available for like 30 bucks or whatever it was at the time. <laughs> now we have the .com, which is cool, but we still, <laughs> we still redirect people to uh, OpenSea.io because, I don't know, it sounds, it sounds cool. Um, but uh, I think over time, um, what's really excited me about the name and kind of the imagery of OpenSea is that um, you, you can think of the open sea as sort of the water between nations, right? Um, so you, and that's really what is exciting about Web3 is that it's created this space that's not controlled by a single country, right? If you think about Facebook or Twitter, it's, they're sort of these nation states that you know, have pretty tight, tight controls over, um, over your data, whereas uh, the open waters are really this... Uh, this new space that give users the freedom of choice to navigate between different applications on the internet. And so the name OpenSea, um, you know, over time has really come to kind of embody that idea of open public space uh, within the internet that has really only existed uh, for the first time since we've had blockchains that have um, been able to kind of scale to more consumer use cases. Okay, this next one's not a fun one, I'm sorry. <laughs> but what's your biggest uh, regulatory concern? Biggest regulatory concern, I think um, education is a big one right now. So I think people, uh, I think there's a lot to learn about blockchains. And, you know, for someone like myself, I've been in this space since 2017, and I've developed kind of that, you know, those mental models of like, okay, here's layer one Ethereum, here's the applications built on top of it, here's how data works in this space, um, here are all the different use cases for the technology. And I think educating regulators about um, NFTs are really not just 
profile pictures and not just collectibles. Um, they're really this broad, diverse set of use cases, and they're not, you know, they're they're not financial in nature, right? They're really just really these um, user-owned digital objects that can be used inside of web applications. And so I think um, the challenge and something that we're investing uh, a ton in is really ensuring that that message um, gets conveyed to government and regulators and ensure that you know, there's not sort of one-size-fits-all solutions applied to a technology that's fundamentally um, a very, very diverse in nature. Does that have something to do with perhaps the, the concern around the treatment of NFTs as securities? I think, the tre yeah, treating NFTs as securities would be a blanket solution that just doesn't make sense for, for, for something that's as broad and diverse. It's almost like if you were to treat um, all websites as gambling websites, right? <laughs> websites can be used for, yeah. for many different things, and to have sort of one-size-fits-all solutions just doesn't make sense. Are you concerned that that might seriously happen? I, I'm, I'm confident that we'll be able to work with governments and regulators to really educate them, but it is going to take work from the entire crypto industry to ensure that um, you know, people, people understand this technology at a deep level. When we were chatting backstage, I know you said you didn't want to say what your favorite NFT project <laughs> that you've ever bought was, so I'm going to ask a different question. Okay. <laughs> Stealing from my colleague Jacqueline, sure. she asked this to some other speaker earlier, um, what was the most expensive NFT project you've ever bought? Oh or man, um, I haven't really bought that many expensive NFTs. I think, um, yeah, maybe like a couple thousand dollars. Yeah. W sorry, which one do you say? Maybe, oh, um, like, uh, I, don't quote me on this, because I, I mean, I, I guess I have to, go, but I, I honestly do not know what the most expensive NFT I bought was. The one that comes to mind um, was I bought a cool cat uh, that's my profile picture on Twitter, and I, I think it was maybe like a, a, a couple Ether or something like that. Makes sense to yeah. spring for the PFP. Well, thanks so much, Doug. Yeah, thanks That's for having me. That's all the time me. we have. Thanks for joining awesome. us. Awesome. Thank you.